This morning, let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 10 and 12. This is the end of the message that Jeremiah was called by God to give at the gate of the temple as the people were going into the temple to worship God. Before Josiah became king, the temple had been forsaken. The temple worship had been forsaken. The temple had become sort of a place of refuse where the people tossed their garbage. It was a mess. But Josiah gathered together money from the people and he paid the carpenters and uh, the laborers to go in and to rebuild the temple, to remodel it, to clean it up, that they might reestablish the temple worship. And so having refurbished the temple, the people were now gathering to worship God. And the Lord told Jeremiah to go down to the gate of the temple and to declare this message to those people that were gathering to worship. And so from chapter 7 we have the message to those worshiping at the temple. But here is the conclusion of the message. And he is saying to them, but the Lord, or Jehovah, is the true God. And he is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom. And he hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Now, basically, the message that Jeremiah is sharing with the people is that though they have now a form of religion, Though they are now going back and attending worship at the temple. Yet in their hearts and in their lives they are still worshiping other gods. And that God is not satisfied with this divided heart or devotion. And it is a rebuke in chapter 10 against the gods that they had made and that they were worshiping. Now, when a man loses his consciousness of God, he does not lose his need for God. Man was created to worship. You can't help it. It's a part of your very being. God created man as a worshiping creature. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, uh, Moses said, lest when you look up at the sky and you see the stars and the sun and the moon and you are driven to worship them. Worshiping is a basic drive within man. You will worship something. And when a man loses his consciousness of God, he doesn't lose his need for God. He still needs to worship. And what he does at that point is make a substitute God that he might worship that substitute God. But when a man loses his consciousness of the true and the living God, it seems also that he loses his senses. As Jeremiah points out concerning these gods that the people had been worshiping. Verse 8, he said, they are 
completely stupid. The word brutish is stupid and foolish. And I'm amazed at the stupid and foolish things that people believe and that people do when they have forsaken the true and the living God. Now, you have to worship something. And it is interesting today that all over the world we find the promoting of the worship of Mother Earth. And uh, now from the time our children start school, they're, they're being taught to worship Mother Earth. Last night on television, um, there was some little ad, and, and there were two drips, and they were animated little drips that were encouraging the children to uh, worship Mother Earth. Uh, save the earth, you know, and, and this whole idea of saving the earth. And those who have become so involved in this worship of Mother Earth seem to feel that the survival of the earth is more important than the survival of man. And, and thus, um, you know, the needs of man can go begging, let's save the earth. And uh, those people who needed an economic source of electricity in the South, uh, let them, you know, uh, be hanged, save the snail darter fish. You know, and, and this whole project was stopped because they found this little snail darter fish in the stream. Uh, thousands and thousands of families can... Uh, go without jobs up in Oregon. Let's save the spotted owl. I heard of a fellow who was taken to court because he had killed and eaten a spotted owl. And so in his defense before the judge, he says, well, judge, he said, I was a lumber man and and because of the spotted owl, I was put out of work. And I, I don't have any money. I was hungry. And so I just, I just shot him and ate him. Because after all, he's the one that put me out of work. <laughs> and the judge says, well, I can understand your plight. But he says, you know, the law is the law. So he said, I have to fine you, but I'll, I'll fine you a dollar. And so he thanked the judge for his... Uh, consideration and his kindness and the judge said now that that's over he said what did it taste like <laughs> and the fellow said well somewhere between a bald eagle and a California <laughs> condor At the present time, we are building a camp for the young people up near Green Valley Lake. But we had to redesign the placement of our buildings at that camp because some nerd biologist found a weed where we were planning to put some of our buildings. Now, this little weed isn't really endangered at all. It grows all over the San Bernardino Mountains, but that's the only place where it seems it does grow. And so it has the name of San Bernardinicus of some kind, but uh, it's, it, it, it was where we were planning to put one of our buildings. Now, you can find this weed all over the mountains, but, you know, we had to redesign the whole placement of buildings because of this dumb little weed. A few years ago, we were going to buy the property that is contiguous to our present conference center up there in the mountains. But as we got into the uh, trade with the forestry department, they sort of mentioned that uh, the area that we were going to receive from them uh, was not developable because 
of a rubber boa snake. And it is the possible habitat of this rubber boa snake. Now they told us that no one has spotted a rubber boa snake in that area for over a hundred years. <laughs> but still, there might be one that survived and is living in that area, so it was uh, not, you're not able to develop that whole area because of the possible endangerment to this possibly existing rubber boa snake that probably isn't there. <laughs> but this whole, you know, save the earth, worship of the earth. It's really being promoted over here at UCI. I mean, they've got courses and classes and you can even get a degree in ecology and the saving of the earth over there. And, and I was sort of pleased, this, I sort of inwardly gloating, uh, I have to confess, you know. <laughs> when I saw this week that the students at UCI are, are, are objecting to the building of a new mansion uh, there for their chancellor or president or someone, because uh, on this place, the property where they were going to build this nice home for the uh, chancellor, uh, someone saw a little gnat catcher bird. <laughs> and so the students have gone up there and posted signs and they are going to have a 24-hour vigil. They're going to save this lot for the gnat catcher. And, and they, they said that if necessary, they will lie down in front of the bulldozers. They will be martyrs for Mother Earth. Save Mother Earth. But that's only the latest. Men have always developed substitute gods when they lost the consciousness of the true and the living God. For man must worship. And if you don't worship the true and the living God, then you will create a substitute God that you will worship. And again, I am amazed at what lies people will believe when they've rejected the truth. I look at those who were following Rosh Nish. And I see them as they are chanting and swaying, thousands of them, in these peculiar red robes. I see them writhing on the ground. I hear their screams and I think, oh, what utter folly. Where is their brain? But when a person loses the consciousness of the living God, he becomes susceptible. Actually, as Paul said, professing themselves to be wise, they actually became fools because they began to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. If you don't want to retain God in your mind, God will give you over to a mind that is void or empty of God, but it'll be void of practically everything else. I mean, you'll become a sucker for anything that comes along. Now, Jeremiah here is addressing the issue. He is addressing the issue of these false gods that the people had made and were presently worshiping. These substitute gods that by which or through which they had sought to replace the true and the living God. 
In verses 1 to 17, as he is making these contrasts, he speaks about the universe having been created by God. That God has created man. God has created the world. But these gods that they were now worshiping had to be created by men. They cut a tree out of the forest. They begin to carve on it. Making this little image. Created by man. When a man makes a god, he begins with a tree, but the minute he cuts that tree down, it's dead. And so death is a part of the whole substitute god system made of something that is now dead. He begins to carve it into some shape. The shape becomes representative of of the ideal that he has embraced. It's, it's going to represent his desire for sex or it will represent his desire for uh, pleasure or represent his desire for possessions and power. It'll be representative of, of that which is the dominant thing in his life. That which he is devoted to and worships. Having carved it into a shape, he said he then begins to cover it with silver and with gold. These ornaments. And then he fastens it with nails so that it doesn't fall over or sway. And then in verse 5 he says they have to carry these gods around. And in verse 11, he tells you that these gods are going to perish from the earth. In verse 15, he notes that there is no breath in them. And in verse 16, he says they are empty and false. And then in sort of a satire, he said these sticks are emptiness. And so, verse 8, the stick is a doctrine of vanities. Uh, They become stupid and foolish, he said. And and then also in verse, uh, where is it here? Verse 5, yes, they are upright as a palm tree. Uh, that's That's a difficult Hebrew passage to translate, and a better translation would be, it's like a scarecrow in a uh, melon patch. Now, these gods, they're, they're made of wood, but they are decked with gold and silver, and he speaks about them putting clothes on them and all, and, and fastening them with nails so that they don't fall over. And when, when you go someplace, you want to take your god, you have to carry your god with you. He can't make it on his own. They don't breathe. And and, uh, yet here people are worshiping them. Worshiping them. Now he said they're like a scarecrow. And so a scarecrow is just sticks that, you know, you put a hat on and you put draped clothes over it and it just stands there in in the garden to scare off the birds. But he said you don't have to be afraid of of these gods. Because they have no power, either to do good or evil. Now, in contrast, the true and the living God, he said he is the one who formed man. These substitute gods were formed by man. But the true and the living God formed man. He does not need to be aided with nails in order to stand up. 
He's able to stand on his own. In fact, he is able to keep you from falling. He does not need to be carried by man because he carries man. You don't need to be afraid of the scarecrows because they don't have any power, but the earth will tremble before the true and the living God. The idols will perish, but he is the everlasting king. And though the idols cannot breathe or see or talk, the living God sees. He speaks to his people and he hears their cry. Now, it is important again to remember the background of the message. People are going in to the temple to worship God. And to these people going into the temple to worship God, the prophet is standing there rebuking them because they have substitute gods that they have created, carved out of trees, and have decorated and have set up in their homes. So these people that were coming to worship God in the temple, in their homes, they had these little altars and uh, and these little centers of worship where they had these little wooden gods that they had carved out and had decorated with gold and so forth. And, and thus, there was a worship of the true and living God as they were coming to the temple, but there was also their devotion to these substitute gods at home. And they felt that as long as they were coming to the temple to worship God, that it was all right to have these other substitute gods that they worshipped during the week. In other words, they sort of were giving God his due in coming to the temple. There was the acknowledgement, oh yes, we do believe in you too. And uh, we know that you are there also. And, and so surely you will be satisfied that we have come to temple to worship you. But the whole while they were still holding on to these false substitute gods within their homes. These little gods were representing their devotion to pleasure, to possessions, to power, to education. And these were the things that the people were really striving for. These are what the people were truly worshiping in their lives. And the most of their devotion was dedicated to these things. They were actually more interested in their pleasure than they were the worship of God. And they would worship God as long as it was convenient, as long as it didn't stand in their way of pleasure. Yes, we will go to worship on the Sabbath, providing there isn't a Super Bowl. You know, we have those things that are more important to us that we substitute. And God is, when convenient, nice to go and worship him. But God didn't want it that way. God said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and mind and strength. And God doesn't want to be second fiddle in the lives of the people. 
He didn't want them coming to the temple to worship him while they were still holding on to these other ideals or ambitions or longings. He wanted them to long for him and to serve him. And him only, he said, shalt thou serve. By our being here this morning, we have indicated that we desire to have a place for Jesus Christ in our lives. And that's good. But just how much of a place have you given to him? Are you like these people in Israel who, yes, you know, Jesus, you can have an hour on Sunday morning. I'll give you that place in my life. But, you know, the rest of the week, I'm partying, you know, or I'm looking for this, or I've got to get that. Paul the Apostle said, and when Christ who is our life, not a part of our life, not a place in my life, but when Christ who is our life shall appear. And then Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. That's life. That's my life. And to me, that's living. And I'm living for him. For to me, to live is Christ. If you only give Christ obeisance on Sunday, and that only a small portion of the day, what makes you any different from these people that Jeremiah was bringing the word of the Lord to. How do you differ from them? Could not the message that Jeremiah was giving to these people who were going into the temple be applicable to you? It is so important that we search really, honestly, our hearts. That we be not deceived. Religion can be an extremely deceptive thing. A very deceptive thing. And you have to be careful that you are not deceived by religion. Or because you are religious. God doesn't require that you be religious. He requires that you give your life completely to him and to love him with all your heart and mind and strength. God was basically saying to these people, I don't want a place in your life. I want to fill up all of your life. I want all of your worship. Now, through the years, God has not changed. And unfortunately, man hasn't changed. And thus, so many people today going to the house of worship on Sunday feel very secure and very smug because I've given the Lord his place. But you haven't given him your heart your worship, your full devotion. And I wonder, can God be any less displeased with us than he was with the people of Judah in the days of Jeremiah? Does God see us any differently than he saw them Time for inventory. Looking deep within our own hearts. Not being deceived by the religious aspects of our life.
but seeking to know the truth. What place does Jesus Christ have in my life, in your life? A place? A small place? Or have we given our all? So we pray. Father, speak to us today in clear understandable ways. And Father, search our hearts and see if there is some substitute God to which we have devoted ourselves, our time, our energies. Those things that are drawing us away from our devotion to you And Lord, we pray that we might turn to you to love you and to serve you and to worship you. Not with just a part or half of our heart, but completely, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? I'm going to ask you to take your hymnal and let's turn to page 78 and let's sing together I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Now, <laughs> careful. Don't just sing it because the words are there. Think about it. Maybe you shouldn't sing it. It wouldn't it would be terrible to be singing a lie to God. So think about it. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Not just Sunday, but daily. I surrender all. That's what God was calling for. That was, is what God was desiring. And that's what God is calling for from you today. If you wish to respond, then I encourage you to sing it. But only sing it if you can do so from your heart. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in.
quite true that even as you were singing, the Spirit of God was putting the finger on something in your life that has distracted and taken away from your full devotion to the Lord. And he was saying, be nice, self. Take up the cross. Follow me. Maybe you couldn't sing that song this morning, but you wished you could. I would encourage you to go back to the prayer room. Pastors and counselors will be back there to pray for you and to pray with you. You might find the joy and the life of dedicating all to Jesus Christ. May the Lord be with you and watch over and keep you as you worship and serve him throughout the week. And may the Lord indeed become first in all of our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name.